This uh, conference will now be recorded. I guess uh, I'll start over. It sounds uh, it's six o'clock. I'd like to start this meeting call to order on August 6, 2020 for the uh, BPAC. I'm Chairman Jacob Haswick. Uh, I'd like to open this meeting with a declaration of a state of emergency due to novel coronavirus, since we are on an electronic moment. Um, if, if anyone has their mic on, please, when you're not speaking. I'm getting some feedback, thank you. Okay, so due to the nature of the declaration of the state of emergency due to novel coronavirus, COVID-19, pursuant to Code of Virginia, Section 2.2-3708.2. This meeting is to be held by electronic communications via web platform GoToMeeting. The catastrophic nature of this declaration emergency makes it impractical and unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location. And the purpose of the meeting is to discuss or transact the business statutorily required or necessary to continue operations of this public body. Um, with that being stated, um, as, before I go to roll call, I'd also like to remind everyone if if anyone does not have their cameras on and have the ability to do so, to please do so if, if they can so we can all see you and know who's speaking, uh, to mute yourself if you're not speaking, and to give the name uh, of yourself when you are going to speak. For any non-committee members, members of the public, um, please reserve your comments for the public comment period, part of the agenda only. And with that, I'll move to roll call. Leah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will call your names and signify your presence by saying here, please. If I mispronounce your name, you can go ahead and correct me and I'll make a note of that. Okay. Uh, we'll start with uh, the chair, Jacob Paswick, and of course, Pennsylvania County. Here. Uh, Vice Chair. And Caroline County, Craig Pennington. Here. Stafford County, Brian Goge. It's Goge and here. Thank you. City of Fredericksburg, Eric Nelson. Friends of the Dahlgren Railroad Heritage Trail, Jim Lynch. Fredericksburg Trails Alliance, Rob Maple. Fredericksburg Cyclist Club, Spotsylvania Greenways Initiative, and Virginia Bicycle Federation, Stan Huey. Yeah. GW Ride Connect, Lee Anderson. Here. National Park Service, Kirsten Tolkien Spalding. Generally pronounced Kirsten here. Thank right. you. Right, thank you. Potomac Heritage Trail Association, Jim Lynch. I'll also say. Okay. And finally, Disability Resource Center, Debbie Fult. Okay. Attendance has been recorded. Thank you. Let, let, let me jump in. This is Eric Nelson. I was, uh, I, I, I uh, dialed into the wrong meeting. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. We've got you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda, we have approval of the August 6, 2020 BPAC meeting agenda. Um, I would like to bring up that late, uh, earlier uh, this week here, I received notification there was interest in adding one additional agenda item. Um, it is Friends of the Rappahannock, Brian Hoffman on the Department of Forestry Greenway Grant Feasibility Study Application. This would slide into item number 6A in the action agenda, and we would move the rest of the agenda down below that. Uh, if you have any questions on that, we could discuss. Otherwise, uh, we'll take a motion for approval of the agenda. No move. move. Craig from Carolina, move we approve the agenda as amended. Second. Eric Fredericksburg, second. Thank you. <laughs> uh, how are we going to take a vote, Kerry? Just all say A. A. <laughs> Sounds like we're good. Consensus, yay? Okay. Yay. All right. Yay. Thank you. Yay. 
Okay, next item, we have approval of the March 5th, 2020 BPAC meeting minutes. I have one item on that, just for a clarification, uh, but I'll hold my comment uh, for anyone else. Anyone else with any comments before we do the meeting minutes? Hearing none, um, on the meeting minutes, um, number six, news of note, I just would request a change um, in the last sentence where it refers to proposed reroute for future planned roads. Um, I would suggest for future planned road improvements, they're not all, it could be interpreted as they're all new roads or something. Um, I just suggest uh, future planned road improvements. So some of the roads, they're just widening projects and things of that nature. And that's all I have. So if everyone's content with that change, um, take a motion on the minutes. Move to accept as amended. Craig. Kirsten. Craig. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? Okay. Sounds like we're good on the minutes. So we'll now move to public comment and uh, Ms. Barber. Uh, I'm gonna actually, let, let, before I go to Ms. Barber on this, um, I'd like to ask any members of the public, um, is there anyone interested in speaking? Hearing none, um, I will um, let Ms. Barber speak to a letter that we have received. Thank you. Okay, we received a couple of letters that I'll read to you. The first one is from Judy Love, and this came from a Facebook conversation that I had with Ms. Love on the, on the Fredericksburg Trails group. She's concerned about scooters on the trails. So she writes, as an elder, 75, with a balance challenge that has caused me to fall and break bones and get bloodied, I walk slowly and carefully every day, three miles or more. I need to walk because my balance improves somewhat and it's wonderful emotionally in these tough times to walk outdoors in beautiful Fredericksburg. I used to love the trails, but this summer I have become frightened by the bikers and even some runners zooming by so fast with only inches to spare. No one has hit me yet, but I'm scared one will. So now I walk on sidewalks across the street from the nearby trails or in res residential areas. I'm safe from all those bikers and even some impolite runners by walking in Old Mill Park. I wonder how many other elders are also avoiding the trails. I understand that all sorts of motorized cycles, etc., are being considered for the trails. I wish that even bicycles weren't allowed, but for sure I wish only wheelchairs and baby carriages were allowed. Just whatever goes about the same speed as walkers, hikers. So walkers are not constantly startled or terrified or hit and hurt. How many times are people hit, I wonder? Another issue for me on trails now is that virtually no one wears a mask. So if I'm on the trails, I'm dodging everyone closer than about 10 feet because the information is that the heavy, bre heavy breathing runners and bikers leave more droplets in the air around them. I'm sad to have to avoid the trails, but I'm in a vulnerable health age group. Again, I'm sharing because I imagine I'm not the only one. I think that bike paths belong on the edges of streets, not shared with walkers and people in wheelchairs and babies and buggies with parents, etc. Totally different energies. Thank you for accepting my input. Judy Love. I think it's her address. So she's concerned about that. The second letter, I believe, was originally perhaps sent to, was it TAC? Does anybody know? Nope. Somebody yeah, we, on here was it TAC? We did see it. Yeah. Okay. So this is from Robert Keith Thomas. RE, the new FAMPO transportation news. What did the public have to say during the recent public comment period? And this is in regards to Stacy Feint, um, our public outreach coordinator, who unfortunately is leaving us for high, um, a higher position with the with the governor. Um, she did this wonderful outreach and she got a whole lot of responses and this is one of them. Would you please read this at the meeting on pedestrian access? Have any members of this committee ever tried to walk more than a few blocks from their homes? It is almost impossible to do unless one is willing to cross major highways or walk along the edge of heavily trafficked streets, usually with no sidewalks. 
One can drive anywhere, but walk? The city, and even more, the countryside, is cut up into pieces by highways. The counties are even worse. No effort is even made to preserve, preserve walkability. We are all trapped in narrow islands around our home. This amounts to being in a kind of prison. FAMPO should have as a major priority to build pedestrian trails or roads with sidewalks between all our islands, starting with ways to connect Stafford County with the city of Fredericksburg. Even within Fredericksburg City, there are major obstacles. Ever try walking from Idlewild subdivision into town? There is a price for this in human health, mental and physical. People are obese and physically weak in ways one only sees in this country. Robert Thomas. So both of these letters, interestingly enough, um, tie in with some of the things. Sorry, you broke up a little bit. Oh, did I? Sorry, I I, I concluded both letters and said that they tied in to things we're going to be talking about on the agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Any others? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, now we'll move to discussion and action items. Um, as you know, we just updated the agenda. So uh, item 6A will be to speak about the Friends of the Rappahannock uh, Department of Forestry Greenway Grant Feasibility Study Application. I think Carrie's going to start off with that. Did Brian join us? This is Brian Hoffman. I'm not seeing him on here, and, I, and he agreed to speak with us. Awesome. This is Brian, okay. I'm on the phone. And I want to meet him. So, um, Brian Hoffman, he spoke. Yes, I'm going to introduce you. Um, he spoke with us back in March at our last BPAC meeting. You may remember him. He's going to talk to us about a fast turnaround Greenway grant opportunity that GWRC is going to apply for. So go ahead, Brian. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you very much uh, for having me tonight. My name is Brian Hoffman, Deputy Director with Friends of the Rappahannock. Um, on June 26th, as my role as the regional coordinator for the Rappahannock River Roundtable, I sent around an email to about 100 partners uh, announcing um, a grant that may be applicable for the local partners. Many of the entities that receive that are on this committee. Um, very shortly afterwards, I had a, a call with um, Dr. Linda Millsaps with the George Washington Regional Commission to brainstorm ways that the Regional Commission could um, benefit from this grant program. We came up with five or so strategies that the grant would be applicable to as the grant has um, about six or seven subcategories to select from with various funding levels and priorities associated there. Um, just as a means of background, this is federal pass-through money um, allocated in the farm bill that goes to the U.S. Forest Service then is appropriated um, as pass-through dollars to the uh, State Department of Forestry. <clears throat> Um, in the discussions with uh, GWRC, we identified three or four options. We then brought in a consultant that is on retainer with the Regional Commission, as well as two or three of my staff um, who serve various counties um, in Planning District 16 and have a better pulse of what um, may or may not be happening or needs in those, um, those particular counties. As such, um, two, two priorities arose, one being an educational um, summit on tree planting and forestry in the region, and another being the Greenways um, opportunity. I had a subsequent phone call with the grant manager at the Department of Forestry, at which point she assured me that the same region applying for two grants in two separate subcategories of the um, RFP would not be competing against one another, which is why um, uh, Linda and Carrie have um, agreed to move forward with this side of it. Um, the, uh, Linda had a conversation. I'm not sure, Carrie, if you were with her when she spoke with the Department of Forestry about um, your guys' proposal. 
uh, my understanding is that was well received and GWRC was encouraged to move forward with their proposal under the Greenway Development and Planning category. Um, just reading verbatim from the RFP, projects related to the planning and development of community greenways are eligible for funding. Grants may be applied to corridor and resource assessment, feasibility studies, maps and drawings, promotional and educational material, and organizational development and staffing with a funding range from $5,000 to $20,000. Um, my uh, original idea that I discussed with Linda um, was that there's many beautiful trails and greenways for biking, pedestrian, hiking, mountain biking, et cetera, in the greater Fredericksburg region and planning district 16. There are many uh, trails and pathways under development in various stages of um, inclusion in CIPs in various counties um, in the small area plans the city of Fredericksburg is putting forth. There's larger um, nationwide or region-wide um, East Coast Greenway plans. Um, and we don't have a full, a fully connected trail system through, that connects you from city of Fredericksburg to Stafford um, and into Spotsylvania and down into Caroline, King George. Um, but there are pieces and there are pieces in, in plans. And I saw this as a, a, Linda and I saw this as an opportunity to get all of those trail pieces together in one, um, one GIS uh, doc type document and include all of the various pieces of trails or greenways, um, pedestrian access that are planned or in some form of development, ranging from some brainstorm in a planning and zoning office to potentially in a CIP. Um, and then identify ways to connect the pieces, even if it is just a brainstorm, um, and that this grant might be able to provide funding um, for outside facilitation um, and a myriad of other things that could help um, get a really good um, plan put together, um, broadly relying on feedback from this group here, as well as potentially identifying additional stakeholders uh, that could contribute to that. It is um, open to suggestion and recommendation, I would imagine, to GWRC. And um, that's really where I'll uh, end my uh, description of what's happened to date and kind of where this could go. But I, I uh, welcome questions and certainly I, I would understand that GWRC would welcome feedback and guidance from, from this body on um, the opportunities that this grant could provide for um, accelerating the pace of greenways in the region. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for that description. Carrie, um, before I request uh, any feedback on questions, can you elaborate on specifically what the board's looking to act on tonight? So um, what we need is not really from this, uh, from this committee as a whole. What we're looking for is letters of endorsement from the organizations that this board represents. So we don't need an action item for the board. Um, what we'd like to do is I can drop, draft up letters that I can submit to your organizations or your localities and you guys could put them on your letterhead and send them back to us so we include them with our application. But we have a very fast turnaround time. The application is due on August 14th. So it's coming up very quick. So uh, just, okay. I can go ahead. What were you going to say? You, you can go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, um, so in other words, I can email all of you after the meeting. And if you think your organization would be interested, get back to me as quick as you can. And we can work on that together. Do you have anything to add, Linda, uh, Dr. Millsaps? Chair, this is Linda Millsaps. Um, sorry if I missed a few things. I think Brian and Carrie have done a great job, but um, if it's all right, uh, everything Brian said is, is absolutely accurate as always, and we've been working together um, on this, and then they're doing a separate um, grant is application, as he mentioned, and we're very supportive of that as well. Um, on this in particular, I think he did a, a great job of laying out what we're thinking of uh, applying for and um, 
would really welcome the support of this group if you're comfortable doing that as a group. And if not, um, certainly to the extent, as Carrie mentioned, that the organizations and groups that you represent um, would be willing to um, sign and submit a letter of support would be great. And also, if you have some other thoughts um, about what we should add to this, or if you have other ways to things you would like to see us address, as you can imagine, since it's a forest service grant, um, there's a certain amount of emphasis on preserving green space and um, tree cover and those kind of things, but um, really they were very excited about our proposal and, and exactly the process that um, Brian laid out. So, Mr. Chair, with that, I think um, unless there's questions for me, that's all I have. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Do we have any additional questions at this time? Yeah, Jacob, this is Eric. I got a question. Thank you. Um, if, if we're going to ask for for letters of, of endorsement, I think we need to have a little bit more definition of what we're endorsing. I mean, it, it sounds, if, if I heard it right, it sounds like we're looking to identify, I mean, there's theoretically a master plan, um, but we're looking to identify gaps, um, things that can be, you know, connections that can be made. Uh, but what threw me is, uh, is when Brian mentioned uh, outside facilitation uh, if we're going to do outside facilitation that's going to suck up the uh, that's going to suck up the uh, any any grant uh, fairly quickly um, so I, th I think I, I think we need some definitions as to what we're trying to do because it sounds a little vague at this point and when, when you're going to ask boards of directors to endorse something they're going to say what what are you doing That, that's all I got. Yeah, Eric, that's a bit, that's kind of my concern as well. So when the letter goes out to the board, uh, some of the details I think that I would certainly want to have is the, the parameters of the project. Um, and I don't believe there was any funding requested of localities, but to be clear that there's not a funding request. And then also who's going to actually lead the project. Um, how much involvement will the local staff be uh, required of them in this? Um, some of those details. And yeah, detail on the parameters of the project are very key. So board members can see that they're they're not overlapping. I kind of see this as an identification of viable short range, like these are high priority projects to close gaps. Um, that's really rational and I like that. Some of our trail system has not been as deeply studied as some others. Uh, we've had studies done on the VCR trail and a few others, but there are other areas that are still kind of really conceptual. So if we can really kind of nail it down as part of that that request to local governments, that would be my, my request. Anyone else sure. questions? This is Linda. Would it be all right if I um, responded to those two questions? Sure, absolutely. Okay, thank you. And um, of course, Carrie is your primary staff person for us, so she's working with us a lot on this. Um, you're right, there are some of the details we're still working on because I'm literally writing the, uh, I started writing the uh, grant today and hoping to get it done over the weekend. Um, so as we send something out, I'll be happy to share those details with you. Um, at a high level, um, I think what we're, we're looking for is, yeah, probably to have an outside facilitator, um, and that would be for the purposes of maybe three public meet, or not public meetings, three meetings of a group of interested folks like yourself um, and, and going beyond like some of the additional planning staff to try to walk through some of these things about filling, trying to figure out where the gaps are and go through a process to prioritize those on a regional basis. Um, but I will be happy to, and we are not gonna be asking for any additional funding from the localities for this. So I wanted to clarify that, but I'll be happy to write those things out and I'll get into Carrie and, and she'll distribute them out to all of you. And of course you can send those back, but. Um, wanted since we're, as she mentioned, the turnaround's pretty quick. It's due a week from tomorrow. 
So we wanted to make sure we got it on your uh, your radar as quickly as possible. And thank you again, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. Is there any other feedback from other localities or anyone else that would be uh, soliciting support? Caroline Stafford, anybody else? So you're going to send out letters on this? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, you're going to send out letters describing this? I believe that's what that's what they said. Yes, there'll be a letter describing it coming out. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, so again, Carrie, then are you actually looking for support? from from us that we will be tracking down local approvals is that basically what you're looking for sorry i didn't catch all that who are you addressing was, forgive was, me yeah carrie it's okay i just want to double check here um so essentially what we're looking for is board support that we will pursue with our localities um and our various uh agencies that we're working with letters of support basically so we need if that's possible okay in the short amount of time if that's possible okay, that's a concern too is it's there's some unknowns with that because of how short time it is uh, i would say we can my inclination is yes i will try Mr. Chair, if I might, this is Linda again, if I might add to that is um, we will turn this around as quickly as we can and understand your your concerns. And so we'll do our best to do that. Um, in addition, I know some of you represent like other groups, you know, trail groups and those kind of things. So we would also be hoping um, once you see the additional detail, if your organizations would be willing to uh, lend a letter of support as well, that would be really terrific. But we will. I will commit because I'm. I'm kind of the driver, and and Carrie's helping me pedal really fast on this, um, to, to get something to you as quickly as possible. So thank you. Will you be looking for county admin level type of approval or or support, or are you looking for board support? Because I'll have to get it in front of our board. Mr. Chairman, this is Brian Hoffman, if, if I may. In, in previous grants with the Department of Forestry and the Department of Environmental Quality, we've asked that department heads be the uh, signatory, not necessarily a county administrator or at the board level. Thank you. That's a great clarification. Thank you for that. That helps on the timing issue significantly. Yeah, yeah, and Carrie, Car this is Kirsten. I think you had mentioned that you would sort of help us maybe craft some language in there. So using the information that we get along with your crafting, that might help us just kind of move this along really quickly if we're able to do a support letter. Okay. Yes, thank you. we Will do. Just so it's clear, can those letters be addressed to the various department heads so it's clear that that is the intent of who signs that? I don't know if that came through. Is are we okay with addressing those letters directly to the department directors? Yes. Then? Okay. All right. Thank you very yeah. much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think we need a larger action. If there's no more questions, um, just generally buying into this. Is everyone? Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Actually, do we need a motion? I. I was under the impression that we needed a motion to buy into going to do this, but I don't know. I don't know. Sounds like it's on an organi organizational level. Right. Yeah, I, okay. don't think we, I don't think we need a motion to do it. Okay. 
Um, Mr. Chair, I would agree that if it's if BTAC isn't acting on this as a body, we don't need a motion. All right, sounds good. Thank That's you my much. opinion. Okay. Then we will move on. So the next part of the agenda is an update on the system of the management for the allocation of resources for transportation projects, smart scale applications. Um, and I will Unfortunately, if you see your agenda, we had Paul Agnello here um, that was going to present for Spotsylvania County. He's out of state at the moment, so he's not able to pretend or, or present this evening. And then um, for Stafford, uh, Brian, are you still going to present then? I had Alex down as a replacement on that. Uh, that's correct. I believe Alex Oziak is here. Um, okay. Either him or Brandon Brown will be presenting our projects. All right, hey guys. Um, yeah. Alex, just let me know. Um, some storms are rolling through in his area. He might have some disconnect, so um, I might be um, pinch hitting for him unless unless they lose power. Just saying. All right, sounds good. Thank you for that. Um, then, with that said, um, I think we're good to go. Uh, we'll just go through the presentation for the smart scale applications, um, starting with Spotsylvania County. So smart scale applications are coming due here in mid-August. Um, Spotsylvania County's identified a number of bicycle and pedestrian projects that um, we'd like to present to you. Localities are looking for, um, well, it's, it's a subsequent item on the agenda, but we're ultimately gonna present this and then seek um, some BPAC endorsements of some of these projects. Uh, the first one in Spotsylvania County is paired with a widening project on Tidewater Trail. This is a shared use path that would complement county plans for a deep run spur trail to access the Franklin's Crossing site along the Rappahannock River behind the Bowman Center. Um, our trail part of this project would extend from Gula Salisbury Drive, Fredericksburg City Line to the Shannon Airport. Um, it would be a shared use path that would complement the East Coast Greenway. And I have an update later, but I might as well say it now. Um, the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors did approve our revised transportation chapter and our trailways master plan on July 28th, um, which included the revised East Coast Greenway route, um, which has addressed some of the concerns that we had at the Fredericksburg City Line and that also at Caroline County. So we do have an approved plan in Spotsylvania, and this very much ties in with that. Um, so again, it would be a shared use path extending from Eula Salisbury to Shannon Airport at this time with eventual plans to go beyond that. Um, at the moment, the trail would be exclusively on the Bowman Center side, um, uh, the eastern side of the road, um, but we are looking at a potential road crossing in the area of um, Shannon Airport Drive, Nawawa. Um, that would get us on the um, slaughter pen side of the road where I just interestingly enough today, received word that our county utilities department may be seeking a recreational trail and utilities easement along Tidewater Trail right in front of there. So that may be really good news coming up. So that's our first project. The second project is the Harrison Road shared use path. Um, this complements plans to slowly close the gap between the city of Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County's paved portion of the Virginia Central Trail. Um, the historic alignment of the VCR trail um, ends, as you see, along Smith Station Road, or Salem, Salem Church Road, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, it currently does not end at an intersection. Um, I re just recently received good word for a TAP application that looks like we may be receiving those funds to extend the trail up to the intersection of Salem Church and Harrison Road, um, which has been preferred by VDOT as a safe road crossing location. Um, we have smart scale previous funded project uh, intersection improvements at the intersection, which will then bring us to the section that we're really talking about um, in terms of new trails for funding. Um, this is a multi-funding source trail system. Um, there are proffered sections of that trail to be constructed along Harrison Road, as well as areas that we are seeking smart scale funding for. Um, the actual construction would extend as far as Hazelwild um, entrance, and then we would also seek right-of-way only as far as I-95. 
Um, this does not take the ability to eventually pursue a VCR alignment along the rail bed off the table, um, starting from the east side of Twin Springs subdivision. Um, however, this is a really good um, gap closure measure. It also helps build the Harrison Road corridor. Thank you. Next one. The next project is sidewalk improvements in the area of Four Mile Fork, Courthouse Road, Lafayette Boulevard, Route 1 corridor. These, uh, I know at the a previous meeting we had presented this concept and questions came up whether this would also include crosswalks. I've spoken with Paul and our transportation staff and he has, he has verified that yes, there will also be pedestrian crossing improvements as part of this. This is a conceptual plan. Um, this sidewalk network that you see here is really focused on the intersection. However, we have tie-ins to that project in the coming slides. Next slide, please. Um, working down um, Route 1 corridor from the Four Mile Fork intersection, we have a number of sidewalk gaps that exist down the Route 1 corridor as far as Market Street. And we're looking at, um, in addition to sidewalk closures of those gaps, um, you'll note there's some um, private development that's come in. There's a Royal Farms at Hood Drive um, that recently constructed sidewalks. We're expecting a Chick-fil-A at Market Street and Route 1 that will also be including sidewalks. Um, but all those areas in yellow um, have been identified as either sidewalk gaps, but also streetscape improvements. Uh, the county identified this corridor as one of the top priorities for um, streetscape improvements, improving the look and first impressions of the county. And this is uh, sidewalk infrastructure uh, along the Route 1 corridor. Next, please. Thank you. And then um, up Lafayette Boulevard, um, we're looking at a project extending those intersection improvements at Four Mile Fork to take sidewalks up along uh, Lafayette Boulevard, um, up to Spotswood Baptist Church. Spotswood Baptist recently had an expansion project and extension level of sidewalks were added for frontage improvements. Um, this would close the gap from that project to the Lafayette Boulevard uh, Four Mile Fork uh, intersection improvement project. And that's a summary of Spotsylvania's projects. Thank you. With that, we'll move to Caroline County. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so Caroline County's bicycle pedestrian project, uh, we are looking to add a crosswalk across Devil's Three Jump Road that would provide access from the middle school to the high school. Uh, middle school sports use the high school facilities for football and soccer. Uh, the high school uses the middle school facilities for wrestling and sometimes basketball. Uh, so providing a crosswalk for the students to get across uh, is ideal there. Um, this crosswalk extension will also extend the tra uh, trail that is existing right now by the high schools to our county trail that is down Devil's Three Jump Road. Um, so that will connect to that and uh, we'll have an extended trail system. So once the students get back in school some point in the future, then we'll have access to get back and forth between the two schools. And that's our only project. Thank you. Stafford County, please. Yeah, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Alex Oziak. I'm our Stafford County. Just want to give you an update on our projects here. Uh, right now you're looking at Garrisonville Road. This project's going to widen about 1.4 miles of Garrisonville Road between Eustis and Shelton Shop Road, uh, pretty much taking out the existing two-way left turn lane and replacing that with a raised median uh, with crossovers and turn lanes at major intersections. Uh, as part of this project, we're also constructing about 7,400 linear feet on each side of the road. This will be a five-foot uh, concrete sidewalk. And also providing ADA curb ramps along with the you know, warning surfaces at street crossings and marked pedestrian crosswalks at our signalized intersections. And that sidewalk is also going to tie in with the uh, recent improvements we've done further down on Garrisonville Road between uh, Onville and Eustis. Uh, along with this, we're also going to be uh, upgrading two existing Fred Transit bus stops. Uh, the one shelter, uh, sorry, at the Medical Center of Stafford, we're going to be installing a covered shelter there. And at the stop at the DMV, we're also putting another covered shelter there. Uh, right now, uh, most recent cost estimate with inflation, we're looking at about a $52 million project here and starting construction in 2030. Uh, 
Uh, next one here is our Mountain View Road project. Uh, this graphic is a little bit outdated. We've actually uh, gone and split this project now into two separate phases. Uh, the first phase was going to be from a uh, chop tank to Stefanica Road. And this 1.2 mile project uh, pretty much could be improving the existing roadway geometry to meet current standards, providing wider travel lanes and six foot paved shoulders to accommodate both bicyclists and pedestrians. Uh, as part of this project between Stefanica and Chop Tank, in the small portion between Chop Tank and Shelton Shop Road, we're going to be installing a shared use path there that will connect up with the high schools and also where we kind of hold our county fair in the past. Um, this section of Mountain View here would be about 18.4 million, and we'd start construction in 2032. The second phase of Mountain View would extend from Stefan, oh, sorry, can you go back, Carrie? Uh, the second phase would be from Mountain View to Kellogg, uh, sorry, Stefanica to Kellogg Mill. Kind of the same improvements there, uh, improving the roadway geometry, providing wider travel lanes and six foot paved shoulders and we'd be reconfiguring the intersection at Kellogg Mill to a roundabout. And that's about a $29 million project, again, with start construction in 2032. I'll have to go to the next one. All right, this is our uh, Shelton Shop Road project here. This is a, a 1.89 mile improvement. Uh, again, we're probably trying to bring this roadway back into uh, current VDOT standards, improving the horizontal and vertical curves. Uh, Along with that, we're converting some of the existing intersections that are both a uh, stop and traffic signal controlled into roundabouts. We should also uh, greatly improve the efficiency and safety of the roadway. As far as pedestrian imp bicycle improvements are concerned, we're going to be providing a 10 foot wide shared use path down the entire length of Shelton Shop from the intersection with Mountain View up to Garrisonville Road. Uh, we're hoping this will eventually connect up with the extended shared use trail on, on Courthouse Road and also tie in with the planned shared use path there on Mountain View. This is a $33 million project. We'd start construction in 2028. Uh, next. All right, here, um, again, we've got some outdated graphics. We're trying to wait to get some of those from VDOT still, but right here, uh, this project would be a US-1 turn lane at Coal Landing, as well as the new shared use path being installed. Uh, we've got an existing turn lane now that's real short and creates massive backups uh, in peak hour traffic. So we're looking to extend that turn lane about 350 feet, put some advanced warning signs there. And then along with this, we'd also provide a shared use path connecting uh, the Forest and Woods Commercial Center you see here down to the Cold Landing and connecting up with our residential centers there. Um, probably looking about a path length about 1300 feet, uh, total cost, this project's about 10 million and we'd be looking to start construction in 2030. All right, this one here uh, might be a little difficult to see. Uh, this is our Onville Road project uh, connecting up with Garrisonville Road. This is a, about a 1.12 mile project looking at pretty much widening Onville Road to provide wider travel lanes and install a two-way left turn lane down in the center of the roadway, which provide, you know, better access there at Baird Heights intersection. Um, also installing this uh, five foot sidewalks along both sides of the roadway to help uh, increase pedestrian use and provide better access to uh, commercial centers on 610 and as well as the transit stop there on Garrison Woods. Uh, this is about a $24 million project and we'd start construction 2030 if we get the smart scale funding. And in the last one on our list here, uh, this is our US-17 business project. Uh, pretty much here, we're looking at doing some minor widening of 17 uh, between Short Street and Old Forge Drive. And we'd be taking out the existing two-way left turn lane and putting in a uh, raised concrete median there, tying in with the improvements uh, Via uh, is also doing right there at the exit at 133. Uh, we're also looking to construct about uh, 1,400 linear feet of concrete sidewalk along uh, both sides of US 17, uh, also providing ADA compliant curb ramps, and we'd be installing a um, crosswalk and pedestrian actuated crossing signals at the intersection of Old Forge. Uh, along with this, at the existing Fred stop there at Old Forge, we're going to go ahead and provide a covered bus shelter at that stop as well. Estimated cost of this project is about 6.8 million, and we're looking to start construction in 2029. And I think that wraps it up for Stafford, unless there's any questions. 
Thanks very much. Fredericksburg, please. Okay, uh, this is uh, a proposed gateway boulevard extended uh, we, that would extend from Route 3 to Cowan Boulevard uh, just east of I-95. It's a 80-acre 80 80 acre tract, uh, and this would be a new uh, four-lane divided road with a sidewalk on the west side of the road and a 10-foot wide uh, shared, use, shared use path on the uh, eastern side. That's that's a, uh, a smart scale submittal uh, next week. Next slide, please. This is uh, another smart scale project. What you're looking at is a uh, 10 foot wide multi-use path on the uh, west side of US Route 1 um, from Ottawa Boulevard at the top, uh, crossing um, Hazel Run in the middle there, and then uh, linking up with the VCR trail uh, just past Kings Mill Drive. Um, it's a uh, maybe a thousand feet um, and uh, not quite a two million dollar project. Uh, no right of way is needed, but uh, it, it'll provide a, a, a good link between the Ottawa neighborhood and the uh, VCR trail. And I think that's it for us. Okay, thank you very much for all the summaries. Appreciate it. Next on the item, uh, Kind of complementary to this um, is agenda item to seek endorsements of the smart scale projects, and this is an action item. Um, I will turn it over to Carrie for a bit more background on this. So uh, this action item came about because one of our member localities wrote us to uh, request endorsement letters from BPAC for their smart scale uh, bike ped projects. And so I thought it was a good idea for us to present it and give some more information, some background on that idea. Um, BPAC has never endorsed uh, smart scale projects before. And the reason for that is that our, our, our giving an endorsement of smart scale projects does not give any bearing on their score because we're a subcommittee. Um, that said, endorsing those projects does show regional support and we can pass our endorsement on to the policy committee so that when they do their endorsements, they know that we support these projects. The other thing that we can do is any locality that wants our endorsement can send us a letter to have our chairman sign if we should wish that. Um, so given that information, we can decide what to do from there. Do you have any questions? Any questions of the board? I mean, personally, I think these are good bike pad projects, obviously, they make sense. Uh, they're obviously been pre-vetted and planned for. Um, I'm assuming if they're not in conference of plans, uh, they're in a plan somewhere um, or they're closing existing gaps. So I'd be supportive of this. Mr. Chairman, if I may, this is Kirsten. Um, I think the, the one thing that I would want to do is just make sure that since it's only needing to get your signature on it, that they would all be projects that will have at least come before BPAC. Um, we've had a chance to look at it, to question it, that sort of thing. So it wouldn't just be like somebody sends something in and we haven't ever seen it sort of thing. Yeah, I agree with you going forward. Um, I think for now, the the specific question is probably for these particular smart scale projects right. that have just been presented to us. But I totally agree with you going forward that we don't just get one off requests on a Tuesday and I'm just signing and sending it off without discussion with BPAC. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Thanks, sir. Yeah, to, to sign off on one, it probably needs to be presented in the agenda as an action item and then get the letter to sign off. Agreed. Any other comments, discussions? Um, Mr. Chairman, just to point out an aside, these projects also are going to be included in our bike ped update, um, whether or not we endorse them. All of them are going to be part of it, either in the fiscally constrained section or the needs section. So. They're all important projects. 
Agreed. Any other discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a little bit uh, late. I wasn't able to get my microphone unmuted earlier. I did have a comment on the Route 208 and Route 1 intersection. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm very familiar with this intersection. I know currently the pedestrians cross. Yeah, if we go back, it's the four. Yeah, currently the pedestrians cross there where it's in the lower left corner that uh, entrance into go down to the very lower left. Nope, one more down right there. Um, there's a stoplight there and that's where pedestrians currently cross to because it's easier than the intersection. So I don't know if you want to ramp that up because that's just a natural crossing place where they're crossing or move the for them to cross further down. I don't know, but that's where they're currently crossing. There's a stoplight there. The road's not as wide. It's a little calmer. There's not people turning as much. So that's just a natural place where they are crossing right now. Gary, um, um, that's a good point. Um, even if crosswalks are provided along that major intersection there, it doesn't mean people are gonna wanna use them. So I think definitely looking at, at, at alternatives like that seem to make sense. I can pass that along to our transportation team for sure, working on this application. There are some details that are still being worked out with these projects that certainly, um, at or near the limits of that project. Um, but we, I will certainly pass that along to them. Thank you for that. Makes Thank sense. You. I go through there every day as well. Uh, I drive to work down there every day, so. Hey, Jacob, um, will there also be crossings at from the car dealership across um, at the major intersection, you know, to the islands? Yes, that was my understanding. Yeah, okay. Okay, because that, that's where I have a feeling you'd have a fair amount, you know, if you got somebody, say, waiting for a car and looking to get across to a restaurant or something like that. What I can do is, you know, this graphic has been used a number of times at this point. When we have a little bit greater detail on this project and the specifics, I will bring that forward again. So does anyone want to make a motion on this item or do we want to make more discussion? Mr. Chair, I'll motion that we look at smart scale projects in order for endorsement. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Me against? Okay, thank you. Next on the agenda, we have ad active transportation survey discussion and Carrie will be leading that one. Okay, my screen is, oh, there we go. So um, I know that last time we had a meeting, we were talking about putting together a survey. Um, we had a couple of different topics we wanted to do for the survey. So I decided to start with one of them. This is this would be a regional trouble spot survey. And as we all know that a survey that takes too long, people are going to just stop doing. So I decided to keep it short. Um, Matthew, if you don't mind uh, going to the next slide, we can just sort of go through these questions. So this first survey asks people just basically, do you use these modes of transportation? Um, next slide. How often? And if you do, and this is a little freeform box where they can specify dangerous or problematic spots or sections that they have encountered in the region. It limits them to five so they don't risk a book. Um, they have to use street names or intersections. Um, next slide. And then just lets them say, would safety improvements change whether or not they would use these forms of transportation if they don't currently do it? Next slide. Where do they live? 
Next slide. Rural, suburban, or urban areas. Next slide. And if they would like to be added to our email list. Next slide. So, and then any additional comments. Now this would, I envision this as the first survey of a few. The next one might be um, perhaps prioritizing a list of projects that localities are thinking about putting in a plan or whatever folks come up, you folks come up with. Um, we have a distribution list for BPAC of around 200 people. This could be given, sent out to that. It can be put on our website, on your locality or organizational websites, on Facebook pages, and then um, it captures all of the answers um, and, get, and puts them into a central place, and then I can disseminate them to you. Um, this can be, we can take a look at this and change it however you guys like. Um, what do you think? Very, um First of all, thank you for putting this together. Uh, my only comment for now would be, um, can you go back to the second question, please? So I think you could- Yeah, by the way, Matthew Lehane is doing this. Go ahead. Um, I think you could probably use this question to replace the first question, just to pare it down a little bit. Oh, sure, sure. Right, of course. All right. Any other thoughts? None for me. How do you what, what carry this? Okay. Carrie, this is Kirsten. Just curious of how you would imagine um, then being able to report out on this information and how we might then use it. So I was going to put, um, for one thing, I wanted to include this in our bike ped update that we're going to put out. Um, but also, I could put this any number of places on the Active Transportation Facebook page, on our FAMPO page, lots of places. I think we should have a lot more um, dynamic engagement with the public, and these little short surveys are pretty easy to create. and. Anytime we want to know the answers to things, we can create them. It, do you envision this um, opening up the opportunity for, say, someone to ask for road widening projects with uh, bicycle access, that sort of thing also? For someone to ask for? Um, can you refresh? Can you I know that? From from our standpoint, from from the cyclist community, uh, a lot of the interest would be for, you know, there are some roads that are becoming more and more unusable because of the narrowness. I mean, you got a two lane road and a ditch. And, and I know mm -hmm. on quite a few roads in the community, you've got uh, users that will be requesting a widening process so that you've got an off-road section for say a cyclist to use or pedestrian um, um, where there is not right now I mean uh, Massaponics Church Road has been very very used it's it's got two lanes and a ditch right you know right um, so would this would this have uh, uh, I, I guess I guess down there where you say where would you like to recommend uh, changes? It would I guess that would be they would use that and just say road access along such and such a street or whatever. Well, if we're gonna sorry, this is Craig. Well, and this one is focusing. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. What I was gonna say the same thing. That might be covered. In <laughs> Sorry, you're, you're Why don't you say it, Craig? I was going to say the same thing that, uh, you know, if we're going to introduce multiple surveys like this, then there's no mm -hmm. reason we couldn't do one, you know, in the next survey be dangerous spots that you're concerned about throughout your rides or your walks. 
um, you know, if we're going to keep producing these, then we can hit all those those uh, areas in the multiple surveys. Right, because my original idea with all this was to get a clear picture sort of on the ground to use the people out there to tell us what we can't see. Because we can't see everything as planners. So, and, you know, it's almost like we're getting free labor from people. Like, go tell us where the problem spots are. Go tell us what we need to do. And we can't do it all, but this might help us prioritize. Give us another tool in our prioritization. No, I think I think basket. it's good. Uh, I would put it. I, I know right now, as soon as I get it, I'll put it on our website, and I do regular mailings. I, I've got a list of something like 800 cyclists in the regional area that I'll That's send. Great. You know, I could send this out and say, you know, uh, here's your chance to respond and bring up things and. You know, there are places that are very difficult to cross. And, um, uh, you know, I was hit last year at one of the big intersections just because I couldn't get across in time, you know. Uh, so so there are a number of areas where where we desperately need, need uh, attention. Great. Great. Well, I can send everybody the link to this so they can disseminate it. Go ahead, Eric. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, a couple of uh, couple things. Stan, Stan makes a good point. Do we want to make a distinction between transportation and recreation? Because uh, recreation guys, you know, they go great distances. Somebody walking to work or taking a bicycle to work might not. Uh, there, there's going to be a difference. I, I wonder if, if it's worth asking how far they travel if it's for transportation um, as, 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 as opposed to the recreational aspect where these guys are really you know, going great distances. Well, I, I, where I see it is, is like, and I, I can't remember the question down below this, but um, uh, if you, you know, if there are specific, okay, um, uh, okay, problematic spots, sections of your journey, okay, that you know, that would fit right there for what I was asking about. Uh, uh, where you'd say such and such a road needs widening with, with uh, uh, you know, a bike ped access along the roadside. You know, if you had a wider skirt on any number of roads in the area that are very actively used, and if you get, you know, if you had 300 requests for one road and two requests for another road, you know where your emphasis is. I think you're right, Stan. I, I, I think you're yeah, absolutely right. But I, I still think there's a, a there would be some value in, in finding out if 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 people are using alternate modes to uh, get to work, to get to the grocery store, you know, to, to how to they use, use them. them. Yeah. Yeah. That would yeah. be that would be helpful to know yeah. how they're using. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder if what, what you're really asking, Eric, is um, like distances, right? Uh, do you travel more than five miles on each one of your trips? Do you, so, so instead of having somebody have to define what is recreation versus transportation, we're really talking about distances. Um, I run yeah, I three know. miles into the office every day, which means I'm running three miles back. Um, right. And that's transportation route, but it's also recreational for me in a way. It is, but if if somebody doesn't have a vehicle and this is their mode of transportation, how far do they have to travel, uh, and the, what is their mode? So, Eric, then that's another question because then what you're saying is, is this your primary means of travel or is this your only means of travel? That's a different. I think that's a different question altogether. Well, the the, the survey says is asking about transportation, and I think yeah. we need to make the distinction. Because transportation and recreation but, are, are not, not the same uh, thing. Well, perhaps not, but are we not wanting to fix spots either way? Sure, but you need or to know. Or are you saying I mean, that people... No, who's your audience? Who's, who's Who are you concerned about? I mean, we, we, we again. Would it be all the above? 
Say again? Can we just state it to say um, modes for transportation or recreation? Would that, do you think that would make it any more clear? I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think if we make the distinction, um, again, we're inviting, we're inviting people to, to participate and, you know, transportation is, might say, mean something to someone. Some people may not participate if they think it's just for cyclists, but if somebody has to walk to work uh, from Mayfield across uh, Lansdowne Road to get to work at the industrial park, that's an alternate mode of transportation. Um, and and they would know that the survey is speaking to them. So all you would really need to do is make the question that's on the screen, how often do you walk, bicycle, wheelchair as a mode of transportation? And then how do you then create a second question of how often do you use bicycle, walk, wheelchair as a mode of recreation? And so you can tackle both those questions with one, but if we're going to yeah. keep releasing these surveys, then when we have an item on the agenda to create the next survey, then we can theme the survey to what we're looking at at that time. If we, Does it need to be like, divided? Well, like, like Kerry said, a person is not going to sit there and take a 30 question survey online. They're going to get to question seven or eight and then they're going to exit out. And then we're not going to yeah. get any results. And no, I so, mean, I, I, this I, question right here, could it say, transportation slash, slash recreation. recreation yeah yeah i think well, that would encompass everything and still keep it simple yeah but the way eric was talking was that he wanted to know whether it was for recreation or transportation if you slash well, in there then you're not going to know which way they're using it you, you I, said I, add, I don't i don't care how you do it but if you're asking a question the semantics are important to get the information you want and if you're saying transportation that 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 doesn't mean recreation necessarily. Does it matter? Uh, well, it doesn't matter. You were saying previously, maybe we can get to that more granular level of detail with um, subsequent surveys. What, what I'm what I'm hearing Eric say is that he doesn't care whether they're recreating or transportating. What he's saying is, let's make sure that the language we use is inclusive, yes. so that those that recreate or those that use it for transportation are both able to reply. So it's that Stan's idea of just putting a slash in there, I think yeah. kind of addresses that. Okay. I'm gonna get so, on my bike tomorrow morning and I'm gonna go between 30 and 50 miles. Does it matter if I'm recreating or does it matter if I'm riding to work? Does it, does that matter? It, it doesn't no, matter, no. but what matters is that we include everyone, that we don't make our yes. language to where it's exclusive right. to certain segments. And also, I'd like to say, yeah, I'm hearing that in stereo there. Um, and also, I'd like to say that we should try to make sure that we uh, put this survey in places where everyone gets a chance. We're not we're not excluding segments of the population just because they don't see it. And and right. that's something I'm going to have to figure out how to put it in the right place. But to back way up, when I originally wrote this sentence, I said non-vehicular mode of transportation because I couldn't figure out whatever. I wasn't talking about transportation. I was talking about a vehicle that wasn't a car. So if you guys have a better synonym for a word, you know, a synonym, synonym that means vehicle that isn't a car, lay it on me. No, if you, you leave it the way you got it, <laughs> just put transportation slash recreation. I think that brings in all the above. Okay. Because I want transportation per se. I just meant vehicle that wasn't a car. Or you could get rid of the whole thing and just say, how often do you walk bicycle or wheelchair? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, what if somebody like, what if someone uses a hoverboard or a scooter or a Segway? Okay, non-motorized. I mean, you know. But that uh, e-bike. It it goes back to the purpose of the survey. Why are you asking these questions? Presumably, it's to make improvements in certain places, but. The, the purpose of the survey probably exactly. then needs to so if you can use it on the trail we, we want to know about it hey carrie 
this is Brandon Brown with Stafford County. Yes. Um, I'd just like to reiterate a point that that Brian Gooch um, made uh, to me and my onboarding in respect to the difference between uh, recreation and um, transportation. And I would acknowledge just as a point of reference, if everyone's listening, the state, the state of the commute report um, is a document published by the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments that has a lot the of- The storm is going insane and I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Hold on, I'm sorry. Not it's problem. not your fault. Uh, I can't hear him either. Can, can you guys hear me now? I can. So I would just ask everyone to reference and, and um, again, this is with support of what Mr. Gooch of our department has acknowledged to me is that this the state of the commute report um, is, a, is a publication produced by the National Capital Region Transportation Planning Board that has specific language um, where a consultant has modified questions for surveys so that they are empirically um, valid in so many different ways. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a resource, the state of the commute report um, and, and it, it really articulates more explicitly differentiations in how folks get to work or they recreate using alternative modes. Thank you. That's very helpful. Okay. Um, I think, um, Carrie, do you have direction you need on this? I'm sorry, what was that? Do you have direction that you need on this to move forward? Um, what I need to know is if I tweak that wording, do I have your permission to give you all the link to this and release the survey? Uh, I understood we were going to tweak this language and then there was also that first question was going to be collapsed into this one? Yes. Okay. Yes, we don't need that first question. Okay. So if we do all that, um, I'd like to release the survey to all of you so you can disseminate it wide, widely. All right, we're all set then. Yeah, Carrie, okay. I just sent you a link to the last five State of the Commute reports. All right, thank you. Um, so let's move on then, the 2050 Rural Long Range Transportation Plan update. Carrie's presenting this one as well. So I apologize for the rain noise. Um, in your packet, you've got this whole report that you can look at at your leisure, but I'll just give you a short update on it. So the 2050 Rural Long Range Transportation Plan is part of the GWRC Rural Work Plan for FY20. This is a 60 page document that staff did it details the population and employment profile for the rural part of the region, summarizes the existing transportation network, and identifies the highway and active transportation needs and funding sources. And uh, the map here is one of the maps included in the document. So that's existing active transportation infrastructure in Caroline in King George counties. Next slide, please, Matthew. So it summarizes existing conditions and makes recommendations for crossing improvements at key intersections, paved shared use paths, roadway reconstruction for safety, safety, shared roads signage on low speed and low traffic roadways, shoulder improvements on rural roads, and an expanded sidewalk network. So that's the work we've been doing the last few months for the rural area. Do you have any questions? Sounds great, Carrie. Thank you. Any other questions? I have none. Okay, with that, we'll move on to the bike counter locations. And this, I understand, is an action item. Matthew? Yep. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through kind of what our plan is for kind of FY21 uh, with our, our two bike ped counters. Um, so kind of we currently have two eco counters, however, one of them, um, was sent out to the company for repairs. Um, so we'll hopefully get that back in, uh, one to two months. 
um, and then we'll have two counters again. So currently we only have one counter, um, but kind of what we're looking to do is, is collect accurate user statistics along various trails in the region, um, as we have done in previous years. Um, it kind of took a bit of a back burner as we've had a lot of uh, staff cycle through, but now we're kind of picking it back up again. Um, so we, we currently have 24 um, chosen counter locations that um, have been picked up over the past few years, um, and they'll be cycled through kind of four times during the year. Um, but as I mentioned, the, the schedule's a bit off because we only have one counter right now. Um, and then uh, locations can be discerned by the bike ped uh, committee here. Um, so these are all the locations. So you can see the locations in the city of Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania County, and Stafford County. Um, so currently the counter has been um, along the canal path at the dog park in Fredericksburg, as well as the VCR trail uh, at Ellen Spring Park. Um, and then probably moving it over the next couple of weeks um, to another new location. Um, and then at the end of the year, we'll be doing an annual report, just kind of uh, detailing all the user statistics through the years and, and a web map. Um, this will be similar to the 2018 EHU counter report um, that is that is on our website. Um, and it's kind of a sample schedule of, of what kind of we could go through with the counter locations just four times a year to so get kind of all the seasons, different weather, um, things like that. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll take any questions. Um, kind of just looking for kind of, uh, I guess, Carrie, correct me if I'm wrong, but a, approval of the locations and to kind of proceed with kind of how this is. Um, but yeah. Do we still have access to street light and and will that help us with this kind of information? Yes, we do. Um, as, as you know, we've been, BAMPO has been working a lot on the smart scale items currently, so we haven't done much streetlight work, but um, they recently, um, maybe back in April, released kind of a, a bicycle pedestrian um, section on their website, so you can kind of get somewhat accurate, I would assume, user statistics of the bicycle and pedestrian usage on our area roads. Um, so I may be potentially looking into some of that if, if time allows. Could you, so you said, you're saying you'd include that in your report? Uh, if time allows, possibly, yeah. Matthew, this is Kirsten. I, I think it would be really interesting once the roundabout at Lafayette Drive right. uh, is opened up and that, that bicycle ped crossing on the southbound side uh, uh, of the uphill side of the circle. Eric, if you'd be willing, it would be great to have that to see how many people are, are crossing there and are actually coming into the park in that location yeah i think i think that's an excellent idea yeah. we should we should grab one of those uh yeah we should we should absolutely uh, use that and and just pull one of the other locations here yeah definitely it's a, it'd be a good location for one yeah just yeah, they, and we'll get that clean clean information from day one of starting to use it that would be really interesting to see that yeah. will also help the national park decide what kind of use patterns we're seeing on Lee Drive and how we might modify the traffic. It could also be really scary. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick question for you all. Um, I know in the past you've coordinated with Spotsylvania County Parks and Recreation on the VCR trail. Um, you typically coordinate with, you know, if it's in VDOT right of way or county maintenance, you'll coordinate with them again? Uh, uh, yeah, we can. Um... Okay. Yeah. All right. And you're looking for action to support these locations? Yep. Okay. Now, uh, this with, gives you just bicycle. It doesn't give you pedestrian, right? Uh, it gives you both. Um, but uh, we currently can't tell the difference between what is what. So it just counts whoever's passing by. Um, it essentially just counts. It's Okay. Yeah. What's it, a, a, a light or something or? Uh, I am not uh, sure of the specific inner workings of the counter, but um, something to the tune of that, I would assume. Yeah. Okay. It's an infrared, basically. Infrared. Okay. Sorry. Oh, this is Eric. I'll make a motion to uh, uh, approve the submitted list with the uh, with with the modification that one of the Fredericksburg sites. Uh, be uh be deleted in favor of putting one on lee drive mm -hmm. and we can figure out which one that might be uh unless you have a good idea now 
Um, just a quick question, Eric. Do you happen to know when it would be possible to start putting a counter there? I'm not sure when the construction and road work is all finished. My guess is probably won't be too much before the end of the year. So if you started there in January, you'd probably be fine. Okay. And, and Eric, I think we probably want to put it on um, the other side. So the that would be the western side of Lafayette Drive. Yeah. Um, on, yeah. on the opposite side of Lee Drive, because I don't want to go through the paperwork and trying to get it put on the federal property. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry, I know my I know my downfalls. We're we're just gonna do it. You you won't even notice. <laughs> That's been done before. Trust me. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion on the floor. We have a second. Second. All right. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Anyone against? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, 2050 Active Transportation Plan. And I like apologize for all this rain noise. So um, in about November, we're gonna start working on the 2050 Active Transportation Update. And we're going to have a couple of new sections. One of them is going to be on micro mobility, which includes e-scooters and e-bikes. And I just want to give a little intro to e-scooters because there was some talk among a few of you um, last meeting that we should talk, start talking about them. So e-scooters, potentially useful, definitely controversial, likely inevitable. Um, so they started showing up in cities in 2017, in some cases overnight. Um, everyone pretty much agrees that they can be useful for first mile and last mile to get to the bus stop, the VRE station, the park and ride lot. They're also good as a car alternative for tourists seeing sites around the city. And they've shown to improve congestion measures. Some studies such as a 2019 San Francisco study showed 40% of the scooter rides replaced single occupancy car trip rides. In Virginia, they currently operate in seven cities, Roanoke, Blacksburg, Charlottesville, Richmond, Virginia Beach, Arlington, and Fairfield. They also operate in DC. Rides are unlocked using a cell phone app tied to a credit card. But low income users can apply to a program that allows for unlocking via payment at participating stores. There's geofencing technology that reduces their speed to 15 miles an hour and, res and restricts where they can be ridden and parked in so called corral areas. This is not perfect, but it's improving. Next slide, please, Matthew. Of course, the concerns, pedestrians, such as the lady who wrote in to us, are concerned about collisions with scooters. Virginia law allows them on the sidewalk. The General Assembly, I believe it was last year in January, passed regulations on them. Um, but having them on the sidewalk creates conflict. Likewise, they are too slow and vulnerable for the streets. There is not currently enough infrastructure in really any city, and certainly not in Fredericksburg, um, for safe scooter use. And the best infrastructure, from my point of view, is separated or buffered bike lanes. When not in operation, scooters can create tripping hazards, such as in photo to the right. Scooter popularity is also related to a large increase in head injuries as of 2019. Most of these head injuries are not collisions with motor vehicles, as you might expect, but collisions with the environment, um, riding through potholes or crashing with stationary objects. Helmet use is inconvenient on these shared scooters, so people aren't using them. Um, there have been fo uh, uh, foldable helmets that have been invented, so hopefully more of those will be used. And there are equity concerns in some cities, um, even though they're riding in clauses to the, to the um, Legal contracts that scooter companies have to follow, that they place fair percentages of the scooters in environmental justice and low income areas. 
Some companies are using their geofencing technology to keep scooters from operating in places such as public housing neighborhoods. Yes, uh, I can see your face, Lee. Scooters will just shut down when they get near a public housing neighborhood. And a little message will come on that, say, that says the police will be called if you operate the scooter in that neighborhood. So that's an issue. Um, lastly, there are environmental questions. When a scooter is dropped in one section of town, but must get back to another, the only way is by car. So scooter company employees spend the overnight hours picking up the units and driving them around to redistribution points. So the question is, does the scooter phenomenon really save on vehicle miles traveled? Next slide, please, Matthew. So the conclusion is we need to plan for success. Scooters may take a while to get to Fredericksburg, but they are coordinating together on a regional policy. And I just lost Matthew's screen. Oh, there it goes. Okay. <laughs> With advanced planning, maybe we can get to something like this picture where we have bike lanes and scooter parking corrals instead of the preceding one where they're jumbled on the sidewalk. So let's have a little discussion. We have questions or comments? I think, especially with regard to the comment that that lady made in the letter in the beginning, that we need to look at a speed limit on our our paths and and a category limitation on the paths. Um, I think this item would probably not be as detrimental as some of the e-bikes. I, I, I think a category three e-bike should not be allowed on the paths where maybe category one and two would. For everybody's benefit, Stan, can you explain the categories? Well, um, uh, category one is um, uh, one without a throttle and uh, uh, you pedal and it moves. Uh, category two um, is limited to 20 miles an hour. Category three is limited to 28 miles an hour. That's that's kind of fast. Really fast. Yeah, and uh, and you know I know I I have to work. I hit part of the path coming through town very often. And sometimes it can be a gaggle getting around runners, walkers, carriages, especially when you have people that don't know what side of the the path to walk on. You know, um, we need to do some education there. Um, you know, uh, having either a bell or passing on your left, that sort of thing helps, but um, but but you got to be careful and. Um, I think part of that means limiting speeds. So, so I gotta say the the woman's letter. She was concerned with people that were running. Yeah. So yeah. even a scooter, right? That is, they're chopping out at 15 miles an hour. She she's worried about people running fast. So we're not going to be able to really address her concern. No. Other than maybe um, doing some social education about trail etiquette. Um, would be more likely to be helpful for her uh, vice, you know, obviously we want to deal with the, the speed issue as well, but I think there's two different things going on in this instance. I the agree. City, um, some of the towns that have done better with the scooters have definitely instituted a speed limit on all of the trails, like no matter what are you you are riding just you just have to stay below a certain speed limit we, we've looked at this this is eric again we've looked at this a little bit uh at our in our own pathways committee um we, there's a certain need because fredericksburg of course is surrounded by hills and a lot of trails are steep so uh an e-bike a certain level of e-bike uh makes sense of uh, the group the uh our group is gravitating toward thinking that uh, pedal assisted is a good idea, um, but uh, you know, it still needs 
that still needs more work. The, the uh, you know, the 28 miles an hour isn't going to work, but but some level of pedal assisted as opposed to um, motorized, which would not be allowed. Well, category so we're, we're, three is pedal assisted. Uh, category two has a throttle, but it'll, mm -hmm. it'll only go 20 miles an hour. Right. Category one, I think, is up to about 20 miles an hour also. So, uh -huh. so that's your dividing line. Okay, uh -huh. that helps. But yeah, that that's kind of where we are. Is we're 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 kicking it around. And and Eric, the Park Service has been dealing with this for a while now. Um, we got an executive order. We had done the motorized was not allowed on on bike trails. Executive right. order told us that we were going to allow pedal assisted bikes, um, mm -hmm. but they're class bikes, right? So just the top off on the twenty mile an hour, not the 28 mile an hour. So if you go okay. to the bike policy that the Park Service has, it'll be very clear because we stayed in there exactly what the different categories are, why they're categorized that way, and why we chose what we chose. Oh, sweet. Thank you. So, Carrie, I've been thinking about this, you know, from the comment that we had received and also from prior discussions on the su subject and thinking about this in relation to the BPAC, my initial thought was, it seems like depending on who's managing what specific part of a trail, whether it's in VDOT right away or it's a county managed greenway or if it's on the National Park Service, it seems like each entity will kind of be having their own sets of rules. And, and that being the case, I'm wondering if if the regional bike ped master plan update just includes perhaps a regional toolbox or set of recommendations for the region to consider. So localities consider buying into this as kind of a, a good guidance, pre pre-established, thought out guidance on the subject. And then each management entity over their own systems can do with it what they will. That's kind of my thought of this within the BPAC. I don't know if anyone agrees with that or not. I, I, uh, Jacob, this is Eric. I, it makes sense. I, I think it makes sense for us to to recommend something so that there's a an an attempt at consistency. Uh, but beyond that, you're right. The the the, uh, the, the governing jurisdictions are going to dictate their own policies. But we can recommend something that that sort of provides some level of unity. I think. Even yeah. the recommendations will have to differentiate between, say, a greenway, which may be alongside a roadway, and a shared use path, though. I agree. Mm. Right. Yeah, we could do that. I, I think it would be a nice thing to have as a, a set of recommendations built into the regional plan. And as you say, say um, delineate the different types of uh, user groups and, and intended uh, users and things of that nature. Agreed. Okay, any other discussion on this item? Hey any guys, okay. All right. again, this, so, this is Brown from Stafford County. I just wanted to bring in another reference from Northern Virginia. And, Brandon, um, just give us a second here. Brian, do you, um, you're on the committee, you're the committee member in Stafford. I'm just a little concerned um, if we're off of the committee um, that's typically addressed in the um, public comment period, or if we can just, have an offline discussion outside of the committee? That's a good point, Mr. Chairman. Let's uh, keep it offline for now, Brandon. Okay. I'm just trying to move the agenda. Okay, uh, let's move on to the bylaws, please, Terry. My apologies. The storm is so loud. I'm having trouble hearing folks. All right. So um, this is coming about because with the COVID emergency, we're all having to attend remotely. And it's been called to my attention that we need to have in the coming months, we need to develop our own policy on this. Go ahead and scroll down, Matthew. Um, the bylaws are just up here basically to show that we have bylaws. Um, just scroll down to the policy committee's draft. So the policy committee has 
this is in your packet, so you can review this. The policy committee has put forth a resolution on how they're going to deal with remote attendance. Um, so I'd like you, between now and the next meeting, to take a look at all of these materials so that we can draft our own policy so that we have it in place. So I just want to put this on your radar between now and the next meeting so that we can put this in to amend our bylaws. Apparently, everybody has to have this done. Because at some point, um, at some point, this emergency is going to be over, but things are going to happen and people are going to need to attend remotely and we're going to need to have a policy in place. And that is pretty much all for this particular thing. Does anybody have any questions? Do we have any sample language from other committees? And do we have any sample language from other committees that we might be able to steal from, please? Um, that is exactly what I've included here from the policy committee. We can take it and change it as we need to. Any other questions? Okay, you don't need anything from us then. We're all set now. We're all set. We can handle it next meeting. Thank all you. Right. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, next item is a calendar update. Okay, um, this is Leah and I just will bring to your attention that the BPAC meetings are highlighted in orange. Originally, you all had scheduled for every other month on the odd numbered month, but um, due to some conflicts, it's now been changed to the even numbered month. And so you will be meeting bi-monthly or every other month starting this August for the first Thursday of the month. And any extra meetings will be special meetings scheduled separately, and of course, you will be updated on those as they um, as they are needed. And that's all. Okay, so our next meeting will be on October first. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, correspondence. Looks like Stan will be presenting this one. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, every year, the uh, Fredericksburg Cyclist puts on their uh, annual cannonball uh, uh, ride, and um, uh, it's a uh, the standard ride would be 100 miles, and we've got multiple rest stops, uh, usually running about five rest stops. So uh, uh, you're going about uh, between 20, 25 miles uh, between rest stops. And that should bring in somewhere between 250 and 350 cyclists into our area. Um, uh, this year should be a good year for this uh, as quite a few other areas have canceled their rides. So uh, 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 the... Um, it's uh, the last Saturday in September, and um, um, the uh, uh, proceeds will be going uh, in part to to the regional food bank. That's about all I got. Excellent. Thanks for that update. Okay, um, next we have staff reports. And Carrie, thank you. Yep, okay. Um, my staff report is that we've had some staff turnover and I wanted to let you know that we are currently hiring, we're currently still looking for a lead transportation planner or a FAMPO administrator. Um, we are going to be hiring an agency to help us with that. So hopefully in the next few months, we might have some progress on that. Also, um, Stacy Feint, as I 
said earlier, has left us for the government, the governor's administration. So congratulations to her, and that's really awesome. But we will miss her. So we're hiring a FAMPO Public Involvement Title VI Coordinator and Planner. So if you know anybody who would be good for the role, pass it on to them. And our transportation planner, uh, we were hiring, but um, our own Jordan Chandler is going to be filling that role. So congratulations to her. And lastly, we are hiring for a transportation intern. So if you know anybody who would be interested in that, send them our way. And that is it for me. Thank you for that. And then we'll move to member reports. Um, Lee, if you just call the names, please, we can go through those. Sure. Uh, we have first on the list, you, for Spotsylvania. <laughs> Um, I'm going to keep this brief. I have a quick presentation just to show some progress of the courthouse area sidewalk project. Uh, this has been talked about for a number of years. Management has changed. The design has changed a number of times of the route. Um, but in our Spotsylvania Courthouse Historic District, we do have some new sidewalks that have been installed um, in front of uh, Robert Lee Elementary along Brock Road. Um, and then um in proximity of the holbert building and extending um to our fire station as well uh further down courthouse road um if you change slides please just some overviews of the new sidewalks that have been installed along brock road uh, this is looking towards the holbert building uh this is in front of robert lee elementary school um this is in front of the confederate cemetery along uh Courthouse Road and um, new crosswalks. Um, also, the, the, the road, the uh, sidewalk crosses over Courthouse Road. Um, there are some real pinch points down there near the, the court building. So they, they crossed it. And that's just a duplicate, I guess, that I'm looking at. So that's just an update on that. The only other update I have, I mentioned it earlier, is that Spotsylvania County Board did approve the trailways master plan update as well as the transportation chapter of the comprehensive plan um, that did include the revised east coast greenway route that we all worked at regionally um, and received support from the east coast greenway alliance um, i can tell you now that we have comprehensive plan support um, that works really well with our smart scale applications and i would also say that locally we were able to secure a um, endorsement letter from the East Coast Greenway Alliance for that Tidewater Trail project. So um, it's good news on that front and that's all I have. Okay, next on the list is Caroline County Vice Chair, Craig Pennington. Uh, yes, I got one quick thing. Um, we have located a citizen representative to add to the committee. Um, however, I brought this up to Carrie. Uh, it's going to require a change in the bylaws because the bylaws state the county admin has to approve the nomination to place somebody on BPAC, and our county admin office will not uh, approve nominations. They have to go through the Board of Supervisors. And so I would like to be about amending the bylaws so that it can say, uh, citizens can be appointed through or members can be appointed through county admin or the governing body um because our, our county admin all appointees of all committees have to be approved by the board of supervisors not county admin um so i, I do have a citizen representative that would attend the october meeting um if we can get the bylaws changed so moved May I yeah May I I'll second add something? it. Well, <laughs> that was quick. You're already gonna get them changed. You're, you're good at that, Craig. Um, I wanted to add that this is the same problem we had with Kristen Harding. We tried to add her last year in January, and she's still waiting because the county admin won't respond to my emails. So, would help a lot. So moved. Yeah, I, I'm going to go ahead and take it to the board in September so that he can attend the next available meeting. But we would have to amend the bylaws at the October meeting for it to be the official, I guess, according to Carrie. 
Can we could at least attend as public, right? Could at least attend as public. And if the next meeting, what we're going to do is um, amend the bylaws to include all of the call-in stuff, maybe that can just be part of it. And so just have them show up to the October one and we'll just know we're going to do it then, right? Maybe we can make the amendment at the first thing on the agenda. So then they can come in as not the public right after that. That, that works for me. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, Stafford County, Mr. Brian Gouge. Uh, thank you. I do not have a report. Thank you. City of Fredericksburg, Mr. Eric Nelson. I believe he stepped out. Um, the several associations, Mr. Stan Huey. Um, I already said my piece. GW Ride Connect, Ms. Lee Anderson. Nothing to report at this time. National Park Service, Ms. Kirsten Tuckin Balding. That's a handful. I'm sorry for that. You did a nice job, Lee. Um, just saying that we're working on the design uh, with our center out of D out of Denver um, for safety and resource protection of the cultural landscape as the trail goes from the new development off of Lafayette Drive, crossing over uh, again just south of the traffic circle and and terminating that trail, terminating into the park. What we're trying to do is make sure that we have a good safe landing for everybody to come to with such a huge traffic change in that area. Um, it will also include a change of vehicular traffic and use patterns that are there. So we're working really closely with our design centers and just a shout out to the work being done with the city on that. Um, Marnie has been extraordinarily responsive and we appreciate working really closely with the city on this. It's been going very well. So thank you. That's all for the members present, Mr. Chair. Okay, excellent. That sounds like um, it. I don't have any other items on the agenda. Um, looks like- Mr. Chair, motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. <laughs> you cut me off, Mr. Chair, yes. All in favor? Aye. Uh, <laughs> aye. Any against? All right. Thank you all. Nice job, Jacob. Thank, thank you, you all. Sir. Yep. All thank right. you. And staff, thank you so much. Great support. And, uh, I will follow up with you, Carrie, uh, in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.